First, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers. Uh, it is a really an amazing conference. Uh, the first day uh, I learned uh, a lot and it is also a field uh, where we're bridging so many uh, different fields. Uh, so uh, going from uh, a biological system and all the complexity that goes with it uh, here we're going to switch a little bit to uh, the material uh, and material science. Uh, and we're all working at uh, different scales. Uh, we can see that the interaction between the materials and the biological systems can go from the atomic scale all the way to uh, the micron scale and all the challenges that go with it. Uh, also, we go uh, from time scales of uh, a few picoseconds to nanoseconds, depending on what uh, we are uh, studying. And um, so yesterday I felt uh, this very friendly environment. And I think that we need that, especially in this field where we need to collaborate to understand every time we put uh, materials in contact with cells, uh, we know that uh, many things can happen. Uh, and having this open door of communication uh, in the field that is so broad uh, is very important. So uh, I, I'm glad uh, to uh, actually meet this, uh, this community through uh, this conference. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, the organizing uh, committee because it is uh, quite a challenging time and being able to, to bring everybody together in such a friendly uh, platform is wonderful. Uh, so today, uh, this session is about uh, neoadjuvant and uh, nanomedicine for cancer treatment. And uh, we'll go more into, as I said, uh, the material side of thing and the interaction also with, uh, with biology, uh, with uh, organic and inorganic uh, components. So that I'm very excited uh, to hear uh, all the, the speakers today. Uh, and we're going to start uh, with Claire uh, Oskins, and uh, she's uh, from the UK, so I'm guessing that it's uh, the afternoon for you, and I hope that you'll be able to stay for uh, the entire day. Um, and, uh, and you're going to talk about uh, Nano Ninjas, and uh, I'm uh, really excited to hear about uh, your talk. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let me just share my Green. Um, where's my thing gone? Where's my presentation? Oh, here. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Yes. Okay. Let me just. So, thank you once again for um, inviting me to come and speak. I'm completely honoured. Oops, wrong slide. Um, and I'm sorry I couldn't make it yesterday. Um, I had other conflicting things, but I am hoping to stay for the majority of today. I might need to nip in and out as my son comes back from school, but I will hopefully be there for the discussion at the end. Um, so I'm gonna to speak to you about some of the work that we do in Glasgow in Strathclyde on the pro programming of nano ninjas for pancreatic cancer therapy. Um, so this is our building in the city center of Strathclyde and um, the technology and innovation center. And I only moved to Strathclyde in November 19, just before um, the pandemic hit. So I've actually been working at home more than I've been in my office, <laughs> um, which is unique. Um, but yeah, this is where we're based. So this is my research group. And these are the guys that have carried out most of the work and I'll take complete credit for them. Um, so this is my group at Keele University um, in the School of Pharmacy. And this is my group currently, I'm just growing it back up since we moved. And um, the research that I carry out in my lab all comes under the umbrella of nanotechnology. So we've got various um, things that we're interested in, mostly health technologies and mostly pancreatic cancer. But we also do some other um, studies on looking at how we can translate those medical therapies over towards food security and crop protection. So how we can get rid of nasty pesticides, for instance, and formulate biorationals. But in order to give anything in healthcare, so giving something to a patient, or indeed people ingesting something after it's been sprayed in crops, we need to really understand nanotoxicology. So what effect does this nano have on the environment and on people? So we also do some work on nanotoxicology. Oh. Yep. So in healthcare technologies, um, the biggest thing that we're interested in is cancer nanomedicine uh, and drug delivery. 
So we work a lot with image guided therapies um, laser responsive thermally activated systems. And we've built up quite a repertoire of different um, systems based on whatever molecule we're trying to formulate and deliver at that time. We've also got a growing interest in antimicrobial therapies and regen med and also spinning out our technologies towards cardiovascular medicine. And as I just mentioned in the food security, we're looking at how we can protect crops from insects by spreading um, more environmentally friendly um, protective agents. And these are quite often essential oil-based and very volatile. So we want to formulate them to give them a controlled release so that when farmers spray them in hot countries like Brazil, they don't just evaporate into the air. And looking at their toxicology, we do a lot of in vitro assays and in vivo um, studies. And then we're also got collaborations. We don't do it ourselves looking at the impact of these things on bees. We're very um, excited about that to see how these things impact the bees environmentally. So today I'm going to talk to you about cancer nan nanomedicine. That's what everyone is uh, interested in here, cancer. Um, so we work on pancreatic cancer. And the reason is that the survival rate is so low for pancreatic cancer. And as healthcare systems differ around the world, in the UK, we've got the NHS, so the National Health Service. And so our treatment options are limited to um, drug or any treatment option. So uh, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, that is approved for use in terms of cost. So because we don't pay a health insurance here, our therapies are cost driven. So when therapies, the first nanotherapy for pancreatic cancer, which was approved of Braxin, um, came over to the UK, it was approved for use in Scotland and Wales, but not for in England. So it became in the UK quite a political postcode lottery on where you would get your treatment from. But we're interested in trying to develop new therapies to increase the patient survival of pancreatic cancer. And so in, in the nano world for years, the EPR effects, so the enhanced permeability and prevention effect was hailed as a really massive um, of significance where these tiny nanoparticles could passively accumulate inside tumor tissues because the vasculature was forming so rapidly and they could leak through poor lymphatic drainage didn't get them to come out and so in cancers such as breast cancer and other cancers this is shown to be really good you can passively target you don't need to actively target however in pancreatic cancer we just think that this is not the case the tumors which are formed are so solid um, like cartilage and we think the pressures involved there there's no evidence that we could passively really accumulate these nanoparticles into the tumor which was a, which is a shame so this led me to develop some sort of targeting agent and of course this is a, a snapshot of our journey we are absolutely not there yet and we wanted to um develop nano ninjas so something which could carry their drug of choice um, to where it needed to be until they were activated and then it would throw out, um, as a big surprise, it would throw out the drug molecule and then become active. In, in my postdoc, I worked a lot with magnetic nanoparticles for nerve regeneration. Previous to that, I'd worked on polymeric nanoparticles. Um, and I was really impressed with, um, with metallic iron oxide nanoparticles because you can purify them really easily, right? as you can see in this picture, putting the magnet to the side of the glass. And I often felt like when I was a child, we used to get the iron filings on the, on the man's face and make a beard. So I often felt like I had never grown up and um, I really liked working with them. But we did quite a lot of work looking at their toxicity when I worked in the University of Dundee. And at that time, there was a big question mark as to people getting these as MRI contrast agents that they were having unknown side effects. And at the time I worked for a um, very famous surgeon and he'd said that this could range from um, just small side effects to in some cases death. And so we tested quite extensively iron oxide coated with Feridex, or sorry, with Dextran, which is Feridex used clinically in the UK. And we find that the Dextran polymer that was um, coating it was probably not rigid enough and it was allowing leaching of these iron radicals coming out and probably that's what was causing these side effects. And in 2011, the UK actually withdrew Feridex from use clinically um, in the UK, which was a shame because I really enjoyed working in iron oxide. So I thought, how could I use what I know from iron oxide, but make it safer? So I thought, well, if the dextran is too flexible because it's just a polymer, what about putting on a solid coating? Um, and some literature has shown that some people have tried to and um, coated these things with metal, other metals such as gold. 
So gold is biocompatible, chemically stable, and the unique property at the colloidal scale, so the nanoscale for gold, is it um, exhibits something called the surface plasmon resonance. And this is where you hit the gold with the laser of the right wavelength, and it will absorb the photons of light as well as scattering some of them. But in that absorption, it will heat up. So I thought, well, this is cool. We can use this contrast agent as an imaging component, and this other one as like a heat trigger for something else. So we set about making these in the lab. Um, so <clears throat> we're a chemistry lab. We um, we precipitated, uh, did a co-precipitation reaction to make the iron oxide, which had a bit of a negative surface charge because of the sulfate association in the reaction. And we then put on a PEI, so polyethylenamine coating, so a cationic polymer, just electrostatically stirred them together, uh, probes on indicated them together, um, and that wrapped around the surface of this, and that formed then a positive coating, so it switched the coating to positive. We then electrostatically again attach these two nanometers, so tiny, tiny gold seeds onto the surface. And so electrostatically, they were a little, they have a little bit of a negativity. They sit on the surface of the particles. And then finally, we reduce the acidic gold onto the surface and form a good, complete gold coating. Now, the reason that we don't try and get that gold straight onto the surface of the iron oxide is because quite often we find that when we were trying to do the reaction, we would have iron oxide nanoparticles and gold nanoparticles existing together, not coating. Um, but also some other reports have said that the uh, electrons from the gold may um, migrate in towards the iron oxide and hamper the magnetic ability. So we, it took a long time to get an established and repeatable reaction for this, um, but we got there. So this is a little cartoon showing you the different steps. So a1 is the iron oxide, then we've got PEI, and then you can see the bubbly surface here of the two nanometer gold seeds. And in high resolution TEM, you can just see that that surface is quite rough. And you can see the tiny um, metallic particle or gold nanoparticles in the surface. And then A4 is the completed gold hybrid nanoparticle. And I've left you this one in on purpose because it isn't completely spherical. And that the reason I'm leaving this in is to show you that if we kept adding the gold, we could get various anchor points around that um, surface and we would actually end up forming um, gold stars, which do have their own um, advantages for other applications. So we sent these away to a clinical um, MRI to see, did they indeed um, have contrastability? And yes, indeed, they rivaled Faradex. We, had the, we got the same T2 contrast as Faradex did, so we were quite happy about that. And then the next thing we want to see is if we hit these with a laser, would they even heat up? So we hadn't tested this before. So we, in a quite crude experiment, used um, a tattoo laser removal system. So it was a 1064 pulsed laser. Um, the surface plasma resonance was not a 1064, it was a bit um, further down. However, um, the, the peak was quite broad. So we hit them with these lasers. These lasers are used already, so we know that they're safe to use. And indeed, we did see some heating. So you can see here in the gel, the lighter it is, the heater, heater, hotter it is. And um, so that's in the laser hotspot there that you can see that white part. So then we wanted to incubate these in cells and irradiate them um, and ultimately test um, in mice if we heated them, do they, do they still heat up in tissue and not on agar phantoms? So this is a human pancreatic cancer xenograft. Um, we carried this out in a cadaver just in case anything happened, but we grew the cells and then culled and just injected the particles directly into the tumour. These uh, lasers of 1064, it's reported that they penetrate about two centimetres through tissue. So we were really interested to see, are, we going to, are these going to heat up at all? Can we measure any heat from these? And you can see here, B1 to B3, that's the control, so no particles and there's been no heating. Whereas in C, you can see that the heating is um, occurring. So we are managing to get to the nanoparticles and they are heating. But what's quite important um, is looking at what kind of temperature change you can get and what's the temperature spread because of course you don't want to cook healthy tissue. So we were aiming for a temperature increase up to about 44 degrees. So we didn't actually want to cause ablation. We just wanted to trigger some sort of drug release. So we were, we're seeing here that we can get about um, a 10 degrees temperature change at 50 micrograms per mil. And the temperature spread was going over about a centimeter each side of the um, tumor hot or the laser focal point. 
So we were kind of, we were pleased that we'd made what we thought would work, um, and then decided, okay, what are we going to do with these things? So there was a few various options. So type one was to use them as a heater nano heater for cellular hypothermia. I was in a school of pharmacy at the time, so I thought that's way too easy. We don't want to do that. Um, and type two would be to functionalize them on the surface with drug molecules and target them. Um, so target the with the laser for the drug to initiate drug release. But we realized that that would only really be um, okay for drug compounds which are water soluble because if you put a hydrophobic compound on the surface of these metallic things, they'll just crash out of solution. And type three would be to incorporate them in larger macromolecular systems like liposomes or amphiphilic polymers. And that would be for if you wanted to deliver um, a hydrophobic, so a non-soluble drug compound. But I'm going to speak to you today about the type two and give you a couple of examples of what we've done. So these are where your compounds or your drug molecules were immobilized on the surface of the particles. We hit them with the laser, this heated up the particle and that initiated the drug release. So there's various mechanisms that you can do to conjugate your drugs onto these. And the first one is to have a thiol on your drug um, and that will form a date of covalent bond, but that is not going to break. So you would have to be okay for your drug molecule not to come off. And for our application, we wanted our drug to come off. So we tested two other routes. One was simply an electrostatic interaction. So a charge charge, we would get a cationic drug molecule and put that onto the surface, which was still a little bit negative or to make a more sophisticated um, chemical linker degrade with temperature. And I'm gonna give you an example of each one. So the first one um, we used a novel drug compound. So my PhD supervisor, Paul Kong in Gordon University in Aberdeen, he has been working on bisnaphthalamide based drug um, molecules for the last 20 years, looking at um, trying to create more potent um, DNA intercalators. And in my PhD, we formulated one of these really, really insoluble compounds, but I went back to him and said, Paul, do you have one that is soluble? And I was aware that they all had these polyamine chains. And I thought that that would give it enough charge. So we tested quite a few of these, looking at the positive charge from this interacting with the hybrid nanoparticle. Could we attach that onto the surface and would it come off again at temperature? So this was the best one out of the, all of them. I'm not gonna show you all of them, but this is the one that we got to work really well. So it's got four primary amines in the polyamine chain here. And the principle was we just stirred this with our hybrid nanoparticle. <clears throat> the drug just attached through charge-charge interaction. We would heat it up with the laser and that heat would be enough to break that threshold binding um, with the drug and release the drug. And that would be our explosion, the drug coming off in, from the nano ninja. And we did find that the drug came completely off at um, elevated temperatures. So then we wanted to test this in cells to see, okay, well, what does this mean for cells? Um, and we put them into pancreatic cancer cell lines, so BXPC3 and PANC1, and we compared them to the free drug themselves. And what we found was consistently in the two cell lines that the <clears throat> nano formulation was a lot more toxic than the free drug. And we think that's probably because nanoparticles are going up by a different mechanism, such as endocytosis, um, whereas the other one's going through um, other processes, which may be a little bit slower. And so that makes sense that it's more toxic, more is going in. And we verified that with cellular optics experiments for drug. We then differentiated U937 cells um, to mimic a human macrophage cell. Um, and we got the reverse. And although this looks really good for us because our hybrid nanoparticle looks extremely safe in these cells compared to the free drug, I think this is definitely a false positive because once you um, differentiate U937, their proliferation rate is so slow that, um, the, uh, that the endocytosis may be occurring so slowly that it doesn't mimic anything. Um, so I would take that value there with a pinch of salt. But we wanted to then test if we heated these up, then what happens? So do they become more toxic when you heat them up and the drug comes off? And indeed we saw in the pancreatic cancer cell lines that the IC50 was lower um, after they've been heated than just non-heated. So again, we're getting a more toxic um, formulation and that's because the drug is not immobilized anymore and it's coming off. So that was quite exciting for us. We then wanted to put these into some sort of mouse model to test whether 
okay, this is on a cell line. I'm quite skeptical about 2D culture for particularly nano things because gravity takes place. Does that um, encourage uptake, shall we say, or is, does it mimic anything from real life? So we formed human pancreatic cancer um, xenograph models. And I'm aware that this is probably not the best model to use, but for proof of concept, um, it was the most humane one. So we grew the xenograph uh, tumors on the back flank of the mice. We then mimicked a uh, gemcitabine regime. So we had one treatment per week for four weeks and 24 hours after um, administration, we hit them with the laser for 20 seconds only. Now I should say that we developed these for local injection. At this point, we were not targeting anything. We developed them for local injection and we did intratumoral injection, which is not easy in a pancreatic xenograph because it's like cartilage. Um, but yes, we looked for direct injection. And what we saw was that in the control, so with and without laser, um, these look similar. So that's saying that the heating, there's no heating effect in normal tissue from this laser. It's only when it hits the nanoparticle. So the laser is having no detrimental effect to tumor growth. And you can see here at day 21, the tumors, um, the mice had to be culled because the tumor was meeting the humane limit in the UK. So we could no longer keep the mice alive, um, but they would have gone a lot bigger given another week. Also the hybrid nanoparticles, so ones with just the hybrid nanoparticle, no drug attached, they don't look that much different with the laser. So probably there's no effect there. You're heating, but it's not enough to kill. With the drug, of course, we are seeing a reduction in tumor size because we know that this is a potent drug molecule, but with and without laser, there's no difference um, at all. So again, the laser is not having any effect. And then when we look at the formulation, the formulation without laser activation looks similar to the drug itself. So maybe a little bit better, bigger, but not anything significant. So it's having the same potency as the drug itself. However, once we switch that laser on for 20 seconds, um, we're getting significant reduction in tumor volume. In, in many of the mice, there was no tumor left at all, but we always report um, the biggest one that was there. So we're really, really excited by that um, measurement and that this had read, um, reached proof of concept. So another study that we looked at, of course, when you send these things off for review, for funding applications, we always got the, this is a novel platform and this is a novel drug. And so, yeah, I totally agree. We thought, okay, let's do it with gemcitabine. So it was, it's one of the drugs used for pancreatic cancer, um, but we couldn't get it to attach electrostatically. So we came up with this chemically, um, chemical linker. So this is based on what's called the diels alder reaction, where you've got a furan molecule, which um, reacts with the malamide. So, and when these come together, they couple, and when they heat, they, the, that reaction is reversed. So you get undergo the rever retro reaction, and you will um, liberate this gem that have been here in black, but it will always have this malamide linker chain. So that's the small payoff for this method. You're, you're modifying the drug itself. But what we found was we got very good drug loading onto the surface. And indeed, when we heated it up, we got almost instantaneously um, drug came off. We got a little bit of drug coming off at 37, but like most of it just came off and when it went to 44 degrees instantaneously. And again, we underwent the same studies. And here in the, the in, vivo, in vivo study showed us that we got a 56% tumor reduction compared to the, the gemcitabine normally. Um, when we had the laser activation. And so this study isn't, doesn't look as impressive as the previous one because the tumor is still uh, prevalent, but it, um, this is using a drug that's already clinically used and you know, improving it just um, by delivering it better. And then in 2017, after we'd finished that study, we think, okay, we're maybe going to look at active targeting it to see if we can give it intravenously and where are we going to go next? But this paper came out in Science, which was really interesting to us. Um, and it was saying that there's a lot of intertumoral bacteria in colon and pancreatic cancers, and this is degrading gemcitabine before it can get to into the tumor cells. And that may be why only 27% of patients in pancreatic cancer studies under like have that have an effect. So we thought, well, can we switch that, um, can we switch that 
from gold to silver. So we started working, looking at um, changing the surface from gold to silver, um, which wasn't an easy task and um, took us quite a while. Silver is notoriously more difficult to work with. But we have managed to form the silver hybrid nut particles. So you can see them here. This is the iron oxide, the silver seeds, and the, the silver coated particles. And we also have been able to show that the temperature will increase when we, from the same kind of surface plasma resonance with silver as it does with gold. Um, and we were worried that it wouldn't increase to the same extent, but it has increased um, to what we would need. So we're pretty happy with that. Um, and we just did some very brief studies to see whether these particles were antimicrobial because silver, the rationale for changing that surface to silver was because silver has an inherent antimicrobial nature. And we were showing that yes, the hybrid nanoparticles themselves have an antimicrobial nature. The gemcitabine itself doesn't, which we didn't expect it to, but once it's decorated, there is still that nature. So the rationale here is that we would kill that bacteria upon administration. Gemcitabine would then go about its merry way into the cells and have its effect. But this is an ongoing study and um, very early days. And um, right now we've got a student in the lab working on this, so we haven't got too far with it. So I think it's really important in science to talk about the limitations of your work as well as what's gone well. So we set out to make this Nano Ninja, which was a little bit stealth-like, not that toxic, until we told it to activate and um, with the laser. But actually what we saw in those in vivo studies is that they had around the same toxicity as the drug molecule, the free drug. So we want to make them a lot more safe. So instead of this first guy who you can see his bomb cargo, this guy here, we want him to be more stealth like with this. So we want to make them way more biocompatible before activation so that they could maybe be used later on as a theranostic. So the ongoing work in this is looking at the active targeting um, and surface optimization. So we're very aware that silver is a lot more toxic than gold and that has to be um, mediated. So we can do that with various thermal responsive polymers um, and uh, ultimately as a payoff between efficacy and toxicity to see whether we can get these to be safe. And we had quite a large scale imaging um, in vivo study plan to look at the pharmacokinetics, where did these things go accumulation before the pandemic hit, but that's just been put on hold because we can't get into the lab yet, unfortunately. And then also looking at the manufacturing scale up. So we work on a small scale in our lab, but we want to know, can we use microfluidics for instance, to try and um, make large batches of these? Cause that would be very important moving forward. So I just want to acknowledge all the people involved in this. Of course, I do not do this alone. Um, this is my group past and previous and also some um, collaborators. And of course I cannot do any work without funding. So always have to acknowledge the funders that have contributed to the work. Um, and thank you very much for listening. Um, I'll take any questions that anyone has or any comments um, that they would have.